Today we'll be speaking with Dr. Sherry Johnson, a professor of psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, and the director of the CalMania, or CALM, program. Dr. Johnson has conducted research on psychological facets of bipolar disorder over the past 20 years. Her work has been funded by the National Alliance for Research on Schizophrenia and Depression, the National Institute of Mental Health, the National Science Foundation, and the National Cancer Institute. She has published over 150 manuscripts, including publications in leading journals, such as the Journal of Abnormal Psychology and the American Journal of Psychiatry. Dr. Johnson is also the co-editor or co-author of five books, including Emotion and Psychopathology and a best-selling textbook on abnormal psychology. She's also a fellow of the Association for Behavioral Medicine Research and the American Psychological Society. So I now turn to a very special Experts in Emotion interview on emotion and bipolar disorder with Dr. Sherry Johnson. So welcome, Sherry. Thanks for speaking with us today. Thanks for having me, Jan. Well, thank you. So I thought what we could first start off is asking a bit about what got you hooked or interested in emotion in the first place? Sort of where did it all begin for you? Um, well, it started with a fascination with bipolar disorder and for me watching people as they went from their kind of baseline states into manic states, there's um, so much emotionality about the manic states that it, you can't help but be fascinated when you watch it. Um, and similarly, as they go through the depression, there's a lot of questions about what's happening with emotions during that phase. and so. It really was just kind of one of those clinical experiences that drove the question of, okay, how do we understand this from a research perspective? Excellent. So speaking of a research perspective, then I wanted to ask you a few questions about your research in this domain. So, I mean, you are widely known as this leading figure in trying to understand the nature of emotional disturbance in bipolar disorder. And I wondered if you could describe a little bit about your work that's looked at um, associations between heightened sensitivity to rewards and heightened goal setting in this population. Sure. Um, so I think that um, what we've seen over the last 15 or so years is pretty consistent evidence that people with bipolar disorder, even when they're well, um, have this um, greater response, greater reactivity to the idea of an approaching reward or having just received a reward. Um, so we think of that as elevated reward sensitivity. You can see it even in people who haven't yet developed the diagnosis, who just have kind of minor symptoms. And Lauren Alloy's work has taken that further to say it predicts onset. So we think reward sensitivity is really related to the disorder. The new um, kind of platform I'm on is this idea that reward sensitivity is too broad. It's just, it's a huge part of your motivational system in the brain. And I don't think all parts are broken in bipolar disorder. So the question is, what's really broken about this system? Where is it disrupted in bipolar disorder? And so far, I'm going to put my money on three pieces. Um, and that's not to say this is the whole kit and caboodle. Like, we're still really trying to figure this out. But three themes we've seen again and again. Um, the first is that people with bipolar disorder set much, much more difficult goals for themselves. And they'll pursue their goals, even as the going gets tough. Um, so one is high goal setting. The other is, and, the, and I'll say about high goal setting, it seems to be kind of there at baseline, in the background. It's not just a feature of the manic episodes. Then there are other things that sort of seem to change in this state-dependent way as people are going through successes and happy periods in their lives, that people with bipolar disorder will really respond more intensively for a small shift in success or positive mood. In two areas where we see a lot of that kind of reactivity, one is confidence. So given a small success, the kind of leap upward into the million things they feel like they could conquer. Um, so that's really, I think, an important part of the puzzle because people then will take risks. Um, and then so related to confidence, the other bubble we're studying, and you and I are studying this together, so <laughs> um, yeah. impulsivity. Um, so becoming less guarded, less careful about what you would do. Um, being a little less cautious in the way you would think about situations. And I think that's a big part we're seeing of kind of what happens with the losses that people go through with the kind of 
as they begin to get a little higher and higher doing things that later they really, really regret. So to recap, the three parts of reward setting that we're putting our money on right now would be high goal setting, confidence, and impulsivity. I mean, it's so fascinating when you think of these three facets, and it makes me wonder, you know, to what extent do you think they relate to, you know, predicting clinical course over time? I do, um, in very different ways. So high goal setting looks like it's got good sides and bad sides. And that's probably true for all of us when we, you know, kind of have our inner ambitions, <laughs> right, our big dreams. So. Being ambitious can spur great things. Um, people get mobilized to do things they wouldn't otherwise do. They go after the big dreams that make a difference in life and in the world. Um, and so one of the things that we're excited about is we have some data we are just um, writing up that says that those ambitions are a big part of the creativity we see in bipolar mm -hmm. disorder. Wanting more, you know, and persisting more. It's a, it's a helpful thing. But on the other hand, it's also a predictor of a more severe course of mania over time. Um, so that's troubling. The confidence and the impulsivity, those seem to relate a lot to the functional impairments we see in bipolar disorder. So I don't think that they so much drive the symptoms as they do the kind of um, the mistakes people make when they get symptomatic, that they later then feel like, oh, I just lost this money, or I just had trouble in a relationship, or I just did something I really, really regret. Um, so different strands taking us different directions. Um, well, I mean, and still figuring it out, yeah. And, and what's really cool about you, what you're doing is you're not only documenting these phenomena or these different facets, you're also relating it to clinical courses you just spoke about, and you've developed this really elegant and empirically validated treatment to help individuals with bipolar disorder, you know, assisting them in managing and de-intensifying these kind of overly positive goal-seeking states, um, which you focused on in your lab at UC Berkeley as part of the CalMania or CALM program. And I wondered, you know, in this vein, if you could tell us a little bit more about what are the you know, essential therapeutic ingredients of this intervention? Because I think for many people, the idea of trying to de-intensify or calm down seems a bit counterintuitive, right, at first glance. Yeah, um, as in, are we the killjoy team? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so we're early on in gathering empirical data, and I think that's going to be a big part of the next 10 years. Um, but what we try to do is a multi-step process. First, we try and just share what we know from research with people with bipolar disorder. Um, and we don't assume that our model fits for everybody, so we'll give measures and we'll do interviews to find out if, if the person we're working with has high goal setting or goes through spurts of confidence or has these periods of impulsivity or gets overly involved in kind of goal pursuits. So we figure out which of these components they go through and they believe are relevant for them. The other thing we've learned over time is you can't just kind of wipe these out. These are often really valued parts of a person's identity. Um, and so we embed everything in a motivational interviewing perspective of helping the person look at, okay, what's great about having those big dreams and goals for you, but also where it is, where does it hurt you and what's the balance? And only after looking at that balance do we think about, is this something you want to moderate? Mm -hmm. So far, everyone we've taken through that process ends up saying yes, but it's not as linear as you would think. There are often parts of those dreams and ambitions and hopes they really want to preserve and other parts they want to downregulate. Mm. Um, so for any given module, once we kind of have an agreement on is this a module we want to try and tackle, then we'll come into behavioral strategies. Um, and what's fascinating is that a lot of times the person with bipolar disorder will have some strategies up their sleeve. So we start by gathering data on how well and when those work and then look for, okay, how do we need to supplement this or how do we need to add to this? And what's happened for us is I feel like what we are is a kind of compendium of all these great tools we're hearing from the people with bipolar disorder um, because people develop their own idiosyncratic strategies um, for kind of downregulating, and we get to hear more and more and more of those, and we're getting a longer and longer list of what people might do and try and how it works. Um, so it's, again, very driven by clinical observations against the kind of research. Right? 
I mean, it's lovely. It's like the perfect clinical science model, right? That bi-directional relationship between the science and, and the patients right in front of you. We hope. We hope. I mean, at its best, it's really fun to try and straddle between those two worlds. Um, for me, I think a lot of the motivation for doing research is always kind of coming back to this question of, okay, does it look like it's going to be helpful someday? Um, and when it is, then we're thrilled. And when it isn't, then we got to go back in and study a little harder and think a little harder. So, Do you think it's possible that these kinds of techniques could be applied to individuals without a history of bipolar disorder? <laughs> um, that's a really fascinating question. You and I, um, being in academic communities, mm -hmm. are surrounded by hyper-ambitious yeah. people who've done well for being hyper-ambitious. Mm -hmm. um, but often then also pay a cost. And I think... I'm kind of fascinated by goal regulation in the general population. I would love to study that more. We're starting up a new study of entrepreneurs, um, wow. another place where, you know, startups in California, it makes a huge difference to kind of have a big dream and a hope and an ambition. Um, we don't, we haven't ventured as far into that area in our research as I would like to, but I certainly think it's fascinating. That's so interesting. You'll have to keep us posted on what happens with the entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think many of us, uh, I don't, you know, I mean, it's a great example of for many of them, they're not going to mm -hmm. want to downregulate, right? Right. right. Um, there are these adaptive qualities to reaching for the stars, so. Um, we'll see. Yeah. So the last thing I wanted to ask you was perhaps one of my most favorite things to talk with you about, which is some of the work we've done together, since you've been such an amazing mentor to me in this area, and I've loved the work that we've gotten to do together. And in, our, in the years that we've been trying to understand positive emotion and bipolar disorder, I mean, when we've looked at the broad landscape of positive emotion, it seems that not all positive emotions are elevated, but it's a kind of a more nuanced profile, right? Like we're seeing heightened emotions that are focused on the self, like pride or reward, you know, like joy or enthusiasm. And I just wondered, you know, how do you think that seeing that not all positive emotions are elevated, but it's some and not others, um, how does this change like the landscape of how we think about what bipolar disorder really is? I, I think that's a fascinating question and I've loved the work. I mean, I really think you've spearheaded um, a kind of understanding emotion landscape more than, than anybody has. And, and the answers are really fun and interesting. You know, there's this sense that it's um, the joy they're experiencing is very tethered to um, making progress on a goal and feeling like they're doing well in something. So this sense of pride and euphoria, mm -hmm. but very um, self-focused. And what's missing in that profile, what's not as heightened, um, is the sense of other kinds of positive emotion sources like love and connectedness. Um, I'm fascinated by that because I think we might have tools at our disposal in basic science to do something about that. So to help people refocus on these other experiences of happiness. Mm -hmm. So thinking about it, your work and your kind of understanding this emotion domain helps us think, how do we help people gain better control in a way that's not about being a killjoy? It's not about taking away all forms of happiness. It's about de-emphasizing the happiness that's about your own self-accomplishments mm -hmm. and appreciating more of the happiness that might be about the small good moments in life, a kind of mindful approach to appreciating interpersonal connectedness, nature, other small, mm -hmm. calm, um, good moments. Um, mm -hmm. So we, I'm part of a collaborative team now that's looking at what could we do on that front to help people with bipolar disorder mm -hmm. rebalance. Um, so your collaborator and mine, Judy Moskowitz, is really spearheading a lot of this. And I'm very excited to see how it goes. Yeah, it makes me think, too, about some of these interventions we see that are focused on promoting gratitude. So sort of these other focused positive feelings. Mm -hmm. Might this be the kind of positivity you want to build while you're sort of, you know, you know calming or soothing, at, you know, attenuating other kinds of more self-focused, high arousal positive yeah. states? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and part of what I wonder about with all of this is how much is the issue, you know, can we help people frame that the issue is not about being happy or joyful, that the issue is about being kind of hyper aroused and self-focused. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, so right now, 
Um, you know, I'm working with this team of people to try and think how do you how do you develop the words and language to share that with the person with bipolar disorder, to give them tools. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think there are clinical implications for it, though. So, I mean, thinking about all the work you've done in bipolar disorder, um, both the experimental work, the clinical work, and the intervention work, when you look into the future horizon, sort of where do you see the field headed? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> I mean, I think that you're a good example of future directions in that what you've done is taken basic theory of what we're seeing at the surface and said, mm -hmm. how do we bring in more basic research tools to test this? And that's what I think all of us need to be doing. So how do we integrate this with neuroscience? How do we integrate this with psychophysiology? Mm -hmm. um, how do we bring it together with the work that's going on in kind of neuroscience and psychiatry? Right. At the other end of the spectrum, though, I think that it raises a million questions about broader social context and culture. And I mean, and isn't that kind of part of the fun thing about emotion science, affect of science, is that you get to spin in all those directions. It's mm -hmm. this great way of branching from culture to subjective experience mm -hmm. to neuroscience. Um, and I think all of those paradigms you know, need to be applied and considered for us to really understand bipolar disorder. So then when you have students approach you who are thinking about embarking in this field, right, emotion and mood disorders, what advice do you have for them? Sort of where do you think they should set their sights as they look forward? Well, first, I think they should come on in. There's still a lot of unanswered <laughs> questions. And um, I think it's an exciting area to be in with a lot of new discoveries and technologies on the horizon. I always think that for somebody entering the field, perhaps the biggest goal is to find a question that they are in love with. You know, the kind of question that you wake up in the morning thinking, I wonder if it works like this. And not to count on that coming from anywhere but sort of inside of them. Um, and that's hard. It takes a certain amount of patience. Like you might read things for a year or two that bore you. <laughs> um, <laughs> and don't say Never, that. never. <laughs> I, I've had those moments. Um, and so um, having the patience to find something that just really makes your mind um, want to tackle a question. And then um, not being afraid to find the collaborators and mentors they need to get the skills to learn whatever technologies it's going to take. Because I think our science is increasingly complex. Um, and having kind of a hub of people that you count on together to brainstorm and problem solve. Um, is going to be, I think, the strategy of the future. So that would be my advice. Well, thank you so much, Sherry, for speaking yes. with us today. It's, it's delightful to talk to you, as always, and good luck with your series. Thank you. So this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Sherry Johnson from the University of California at Berkeley.